<laughs> Today's scripture reading is Psalm 122, Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. To praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of, Jer of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, said concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nation and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Good morning, church family. Who's excited to decorate the church this evening? I tell you what, I, and this is all honesty, I look forward to decorating the church more than I look decorating my own house. And the only reason I'm decorating my house is kind of uh, get a, get a point across. So if you want to know how I'm decorating it, I'm getting a piece of plywood, some LED lights, and I'm spelling out the word ditto with an arrow point towards the park. You all know how the... The park's all lit up and everything. Yep, ditto. Just to get a point across my mom. Anyways, I have, do have one confession to make today. The sermon, is, the sermon today is not my sermon. It's a sermon I stumbled across this week, especially at home when in between cooking a turkey, um, I discovered and, and it's too full of good stuff. I couldn't make it my own. But I wanted to share this blessing that this word had brought to me, and I want to give it to you guys as well. But let's start. Psalm 122 invites us to rejoice or to be glad. But what is the difference there? I was glad when they said to me, it's time to go. Time to get moving. Time to get up and go, get up from here and go to where God is, where God is experienced. I was glad. And most of us who come here today, we are glad, whoa boy, most of us who come here today, this week, we are glad to be here, or we are glad at one time or another. But has worship, has coming to worship lost something though? Has the gladness no, is the gladness no longer there? Have we been buried with the burdens of living in the world that we are in today? Are we laden with so many things that it's hard to find that childlike gladness uh, that is at the root of our faith, that is at the root of coming to church? How many of you are excited to come to church? Amen, little one. It is hard to find gladness at what is coming to us. We are afraid what might be next rather than rejoicing in the possibilities. We know too much. Life used to be simpler, right? Or is that just my imagination? No cell phones. There does seem to be a longing to get back to simpler times, so to speak, a greater time. A time when everything made sense. But did such a time ever really exist, though? Or were there, were there, time, 
There were times when I thought I had it all figured out, as most of us, 20, well, not right now, but let's say 20 year old, as our 20 year old self, we thought I had it all figured out. It, but at the time, things were easier for us. And no doubt that there were times that it was easier for you as well. But was it easier for everyone else? I remember when I felt like everything was pretty simple, but I didn't realize the anxiety and the stress that my parents were going through when it came to raising me and my sister. And the choices that I now question were made out of fear of the moment and the desire to provide and to make sense at the time. I learned, I heard the stories that my mom, how my mom and dad grew up, growing up poor. How my dad had to go like a couple miles down the road to an old, I think it was, it was a pecan or walnut tree. And they would collect like, a, I think a 50 gallon drum was a couple of, I can't remember how many bushel it was, but they would fill two or three of those and sell it at market, and that would be their Christmas money. They were that poor. But grandpa, Grandma and Grandpa did their best, especially with Mom and Dad and the stories that they shared with me. Because like, oh, the one thing my dad uh, said to me is, one thing I regret about raising you is I made you grow up too fast. Same time, it's a blessing. But that's our problem, though. At the time when we made those choices, it made sense at the time. But our vision was limited. We couldn't see well. We couldn't see what we needed to see. We couldn't see God at work in the world. And we were left to muddle through with the best we had. And sometimes our best wasn't enough. What we see troubles us, limits us, divides us. What we see is what, what's in front of our faces, the problems to solve, the roadblocks to navigate. But what if we could see better, see further, see the word at work? When we read our Isaiah text, we usually skip right to the prophecy portion of the text that is so compelling and so radical to think of. But that is the prophecy that drives us this Advent season. That is our hope. We lean into these words of hope for the future of the world where swords will be beaten into plows and the words that we speak will be words of peace and love. But doesn't anyone find it interesting that in our psalm text, the psalmist talks about the peace of Jerusalem? Which, by the way, the meaning of Jer the name Jerusalem is city of peace. The psalmist invites us to Jerusalem, to the city of peace, who are bonded firmly with one another. But isn't it ironic, though? How can Jerusalem be a city of peace when they are in constant conflict? When they hold the most valuable land in all the world in the Middle East that connects the Middle East with Africa. It's basically one big land, high, uh, land bridge highway. How many times have the walls been torn down in the city and been rebuilt? You can actually read the wall to this day of you know how in soils like uh, if you were to, like take like uh, read the soil lines and it shows you each little timeline just by the color that's the walls of Jerusalem they read like a timeline of how many times they've been burnt uh, torn down and rebuilt how many times have the temples been rebuilt and that includes the pagan ones how much blood has been spilled on the streets with cries for help echoing off the walls of the homes and the walls that surround the city? It's not so much a city of peace, but a city of war for centuries and even a millennia of constant battling over this one little piece of land. Yet, let's read verse 1 again. Or I'll remind you of verse 1. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judea and Jerusalem. 
Did you catch it though that time? The word that Isaiah saw. Not heard, but saw. Oh, I know those prophets. What are, what are they going to do? They're a little bit goofy at times, right? They're living out there on the edge of society, shouting at passerbys, running for their lives, hiding in caves, calling down fire. Yeah, those things did happen to the prophets. They didn't have an easy life. Their main job was to hold up a mirror to your face and say, hey, take a look in the mirror. And how many people actually like looking at themselves in the mirror? So no wonder why they were excluded from the best parties. And no wonder they got kicked out of the best clubs in Jerusalem. No one wanted to be around them because they showed the truth. But this was Isaiah. Isaiah was not the run-of-the-mill prophet. He was basically a corporate prophet. Dressed all nice and he, was, he probably had his chambers down from the king's chambers. He probably had his own little secretary for the, for the press conference he would release later that day. You got it. They didn't have press conference back then, guys. He lived a good life until it all came crumbling down. He didn't spout any sort of party line. He wasn't a mouthpiece for the king. And it's kind of amazing that he was able to keep his job as long as he did, given that uh, more often than not, that he would share bad news and do a lot of finger pointing and pronounce doom and gloom to a lot of people. I mean, how many of you want to be in a room with that guy who's like, so how's your day? Our world's coming to an end. And he, they say that to you every day or every other day. And he's like, it's like, dude, shut up. Give me something good. <laughs> There's nothing good in the world. The kind, maybe those in the power considered him as a lightning rod. As long as he was there giving warnings and calling them to a higher standard, then nothing bad would actually happen to them. And it kind of makes you wonder if anyone was actually listening to him or whether they just shook his hand each week and say, nice sermon, Pastor Isaiah, and went about their business. And he had to bite his tongue every now and then, just so he would not say, weren't you listening to me? It was messy. It was a messy time. And here at the beginning of the book, it even got worse from there on. When doom fell, when the enemy swept through the land, when the country crashed around their ears, and they were left in the burning rubble, or carried away to a foreign land where they were sure even God had abandoned them. All that is yet to come for Isaiah here in chapter 2. But this is not the place. It is a place of intrigue. It is ringing the bell to, the, to call back the powers that may be to be the powers that is. Now it is warnings and worries in the day-to-day -day of running a nation. And still Isaiah manages to see something more than the doom and gloom. That the word, the word that Isaiah saw, what did he see? He saw the mount of the Lord's house in an odd configuration, that it rose above all the other mountains, above all the other houses, and not to lord over them, but to invite them in. That is to invite the world, the whole world, not to conquer the world, but to teach them, to give them wisdom, to teach, it about, teach its people about peace, love, grace, and mercy. Peace, the end of war, that the claim, and that calamity that tears the very fabric of existence. The house of the Lord, the people of God, will teach peace. And apparently they will teach farming as well, because if you're not killing each other, you got to feed one another. So what better yet than turning the, your swords into plows and farming the land to bring, bring life into it? Isaiah could see all that before him. He could see the hope, 
the word at work. Even when the when, even when he could not when the word was not present all around him, he could still see it if he looked hard enough. Even in the corridors of power that seemed hell bent on making things worse rather than better. Even as people went merrily down the path that led them to destruction, Isaiah saw the word. He saw another way, another hope. It seems to me that the call to Advent this season is not a proclamation of doom, but to see hope, to see the possibilities. If, excuse me, even when no one else can see them, we are called to not give up on hope and to walk in the light of the Lord this day, this Advent season. That we are called to walk by the light we see in hope. Move toward the kind of world that God has in store. Work for what makes for peace, even while we work to repair what is broken. Maybe gladness then can return here this Advent season that is about to take us over. Maybe what we can remember is that we gather not for an empty ritual that does not make any difference in the world or in our lives, but what we go to the house of the Lord to do is to learn peace, to learn love, to learn mercy and grace. And we come here to learn about how to live out that peace, to teach that peace. We are being made this day into disciples, disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That is the Advent proclamation this year. We are transforming the world one person at a time, the whole world. We are gathering in the Lord's house this day, this Advent season, to restore our mission to restore our hearts, to restore our gladness. I was glad. We were glad. Let's be glad up to when restoration is finally experienced by, to all who come to the house of the Lord this day. Amen.